And let me first introduce myself. My name is Arel Angelsen. I'm a professor at the Norwegian University of Life Science. Um, and I'm also an associate of C4. Now, I, one of my capacities in the, the department is at the head of the recruitment committee. And there is a story about three applicants for a job, an accountant, an economist, and a mathematician. And, and they were called for an interview, and they were just asked one question. And the question was, what is two plus two? And first, the economist comes in and he says, well, that's very easy. Two plus two is four. And then comes the mathematician, and he's asked the same question, said, well, it depends a lot on the assumptions you make, but in most cases, I would say it is four. And then comes the accountant, and he gets the same question, and he looks around and sees if all the doors are closed, and he said, well, it depends. What do you want it to be? And this also goes for accounting in of, of carbon emissions or forest stocks or money flows. It's not an exact answer to all of this. What do we want the number to be? And the answer quite often depends on, on what we want the number to be. In this session, we are going to, to look at the red performance in the landscape. And most of the, or not most of them, all the four speakers here that I will introduce in a moment are part of this global comparative study on red that is headed by C4 and involving a, a large number of partners. So just a few words on, on that project and what we hope to get out of this session. Um, um, so the purpose of this project that started, oh, one at a time. Uh, and the purpose of this project is for, to support red policy arenas and practitioners or communities with both information, for example, a number of country studies, country profiles that have been useful to analyze and do research and publish of that, and also provide some tools that can be used in uh, the implementation of RED. And we developed this 3E or 3E plus outcomes in terms of effectiveness, efficiency, and equity and co-benefits beyond the, the carbon benefits. Uh, so as a general framework. Now, it's four major components now in this phase two that started this year. Is it possible to only get one? I mean, yeah. uh, okay. Um, the first focus on national policy, the politics and the policies um, at primarily the national level around this. What is needed to get the transformation change? The second, looking at red project activities, mainly at local levels and 20 plus pilot projects in six countries being the focus of that. The third, the MRV, including reference level discussions on how to set this and how to help and assist and provide good inputs into the MRV development. And the fourth, uh, a new module on carbon management at the landscape level. Um, some of this, I just put up one of the, those who were published in the book last year by Maria Brocco sitting here and, and myself is a chapter, it's a figure from that of this four eyes that we introduced. You know when you get older it's nice to intervene some rules of, of thumb. So we have the three E's, effectiveness, efficiency, equity, and the four eyes which are that on this arena you have actors and each of these actors they have their particular set of interests, they have the ideas including ideologies, they have certain information and all this is taking place on a, an, uh, an arena where there are certain rules of the games or institutions, leading to policy process and outcomes. So it's a good framework to help to understand what's happening in there. And that also is true for data. There is the politics of data generation. We just saw yesterday some news uh, published in, in data in science presenting quite new deforestation or rather forest cover change figures that will certainly spark a lot of debate and being used selectively to whatever to fit certain interests and ideas that different actors have. These are the countries working in and, and even more being added. I don't need to, to, to list them all, you can read. Um, three volumes that have been produced, synthesizing and, and is available of course for free download at uh, at the website. Just to acknowledge those who have sponsored this, the governments and aid agencies of Norway, Australia, EC and, and UK, 
and there are also other grants, but these are the four majors, plus literally hundreds of people that have been involved in that and farmers and others sharing information. Now for this session, we look at red performance in landscape and these are the presenters that we will see, starting with Martin and then Fer, Naya and, and Daniel at last to give the introduction. I'll introduce each of them when it comes. But just the focus that we have, we do the accounting for a purpose. Very few of us, I mean, there are some people like Martin Harold that have a pleasure in measuring in itself. But for most of us, it's a tool for the next step. So we use it. So what's the purpose of this? Now, two purposes that I think it would be nice to focus on, and I hope you also can help and get involved. One is to do the MRVing for implementing a landscape approach. For example, that we can analyze the actors and the interaction among different sectors and actors that operate in the landscape. And the second, the process itself of MRV generation, for I think we'll hear some of that from Nepal, can contribute to implementing the landscape approach. So data is not just a pro product, it's a process. And the second is MRV as a basis for a performance-based system, which is, I would say, a core original idea of RED, that it should develop these performance-based systems. So can MRV be used to support or form the basis for that? Uh, get involved, as a few of us here, but we try a new thing if you will be given the chance to speak up, but we'll also distribute some cards that you can write down. See, Lee and, and a couple of others will distribute them for you. And then there's something called tweets. For those over 40, it's uh, something, it's uh, twitter.com, and you get your account, and you can say whatever you want, and maybe someone will read it too. If you want to, to tweet, you're welcome to do it. We have the general hashtag forum that uh, is GLF COP19, and it's also a particular one for this session called hashtag DF3. So three ways of communicating by card, old-fashioned, well-proven technology, by tweets or just standing up and, and speaking in, in the audience after we have heard the presentations. So with that, I'm happy to introduce Martin Harold, the first speaker who will try to give a, well, I'm not just trying, I'm sure he will, uh, give a broad overview of, of MRV systems before we have the, the, uh, the three country studies. Martin is professor at uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands, professor of, of remote sensing and geoinformatics. So, welcome, Martin. Thank you very much, Harold. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there are more things that excite me than measuring, uh, first of all. And among of them is speaking in a classic old university hall like this. You don't see many of those around anymore. So, so this is really classic. And so that's something that I find exciting, among other things. So, and um, as part of that, I'm, I'm trying to uh, start off thinking a bit about monitoring Red Plus landscapes. And as we, we're here at the UNFCCC Conference of the Parties, and we've been following a bit what has been discussed and negotiated in terms of monitoring for Red Plus on the UNFCC arena, knows that most of it has been focused on modalities for monitoring and MRV for Red Plus to support countries' abilities to report to the international level. So a lot of has been about the IPCC good practice guidelines and, and, and about uh, technicalities, capacities, and these kind of things to bring country up to speed to actually do that. And the technical community has been trying to provide some input to that process, uh, which is the technical, one of the technical source books that has been put out. It's available, some of you may know it, and I don't want to say a whole more about it, except that we'll have a new set of training modules alongside this uh, that are becoming available early next year that if people want to use the tool and want to use uh, um, that guideline um, that it actually becomes a bit easier and can be used more for training than it has been in the past. But what I'm not going to do today is talk about these national capacities and national ways to report to the international level because what we are seeing now is that Red Plus is moving into phase two and phase two is that 
the payments for performance is moving much more into the center of attention. And just as one example, those are some of the countries that have put forward proposal to the carbon fund uh, that like to get started on actually getting paid for, 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 for performance. And you see most of them have, are actually subnational um, initiatives, usually some kind of jurisdictional dimension. And what we are now seeing is that, that this payment for performance and this need to actually create emission reductions, because performance um, it has to be based on emission reduction or removals or increased removals, that this is actually getting much more important. And that, of course, raises other things than just reporting on carbon to the international level. One of the first things that if you want to stimulate activities um, to reduce emissions or increase removals of carbon is that you have to think about so what is changing my forests. And we all know the debate about drivers, about approximate drivers, the direct cause of deforestation. There was a report that was put out um, at the last COP, in fact, where um, some scientists, C4 and partners, have looked into what are the most important direct drivers of deforestation. And, and that is not news that it's mostly agriculture by a large amount that is driving deforestation. So what SAPSTA has done so the negotiating body that uh, negotiates these technical things under the convention has actually proposed a decision on, on drivers of deforestation. I'm just going to go through some of these things that have been put forward there. It's, it's, it's up for decision at this COP, in fact. Um, for example, that it notes the complexity of the problem in terms of drivers, different national circumstances and multi multiple drivers at work, that countries should address drivers when developing and implementing their national strategies for Red Plus, that it requires participation of relevant stakeholders. It's important to take into account different sectors and that they have to, have to be involved for addressing drivers, that international cooperation can contribute to that process because some drivers are international drivers that countries cannot deal with them on their, on their own. Uh, it encourages uh, parties, organizations in the private sector to reduce drivers, and it notes that livelihoods may depend on drivers, and there are implications when addressing drivers when it comes to economic costs and domestic resources. So just by, uh, and that's about what SAPSTA has, can say about drivers. It's rather general if you think about it, but basically it gives countries some ideas on how important it is, first of all, to address drivers. And that is that you have to think beyond forests. And you have to think about many other dimensions uh, than forests if you actually like to address drivers and address them in a way so you can actually reduce emissions. In the Global Comparative Study, we have done an anal analysis to look into the way countries have tried to address drivers in their readiness proposal. So this is a graph that uh, is based on, uh, for 43 countries, based on 90 and, uh, 98 uh, readiness documents. And we have grouped the countries in those that have actually taken on board, that have assessed the drivers and developed their planned Red Plus interventions out of the, out of the drivers, and those that have just listed a Red Plus intervention without considering drivers. And so what you see, the countries that have uh, done uh, a clear, developed a clear relationship between drivers and interventions that are shown in, shown in red, the other ones are shown in blue, that the ones who have um, uh, basically um, not taken drivers into, into account as, as much, they mainly propose forest-related uh, interventions, such as sustainable forest management, protected areas strategies, afforestation and reforestation. There are a couple of interventions that are really they're basically both country cases are equal, such as agroforestry, plantation is, uh, establishment, and, and dealing with fuel wood and fuel wood e efficiency. And then if you look at the, uh, the areas where the red, the countries shown in, in, in red here, are most prominent, those are the ones um, where most of these activities are actually outside the forest, such as agricultural intensification, livestock man management, sustainable mining, um, and so on. So basically, the countries that have analyzed the drivers and planned their interventions based on the importance of specific drivers, what they point at is there's a lot of activities actually outside the forest that do affect it, and that has to be taken uh, into account. So what, 
What can we learn from this analysis? Well, first of all, um, that many red plus interventions are actually outside the forest. And if you do think about you know, changing the way agriculture is done to reduce the pressure on the forest, it can actually be quite hard to link it to a specific forest carbon impact to, let's say, which type of, which forest has been saved and how much forest has been saved because of this act activity. The second thing is that if you do want to uh, monitor the activities, these outside forest area activities as part of your Red Plus implementation program, you have to monitor quite a few things outside the forests. And that is something that has to be taken into, into account. Still, the national forest-related greenhouse gas impact has to be assessed on the national level to uh, be reported. Um, but the internal monitoring within the country does has to think far beyond forest to actually, um, well, to be used as a policy tool to support Red Plus interventions. The other question is that, as I said, um, most some activities are outside the forest, and it's really hard to relate these activities to specific forest carbon savings, um, unless you want to get every stakeholder and every landowner to be a Red Plus project on his own. It will be very hard to pay them based on forest carbon per 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 performance. And so basically what that means, we have to think about different ways of actually sharing, uh, generating and sharing benefits in these contexts. So if you think about objectives then for Red Plus monitoring on the national level, uh, besides meeting these international reporting requirements, it needs to underpin and stimulate strategies and priorities for Red Plus implementation. It has to track performance of Red Plus activities and their impacts, which include carbon, both non carbon and non carbon. And it has to support the generation and the sharing of, 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 ben of benefits. And that's basically a broader, a much broader objective than what you have uh, as it comes to international reporting. If you take into account the Substar guidance on drivers, which highlights multi-sector issues, the involvement of stakeholders, the importance of livelihoods, it is clear that we talk about red performance in a landscape context, thinking about more hol hol holistically, thinking about more, more inter inter integrated. So basically, we're talking about an, um, an increase in monitoring uh, and assessment needs. And that certainly raises the questions versus simplicity versus complexity. Because if you think about landscape uh, and we think about monitoring the multiple impacts of Red Plus and the links to benefit sharing, we're talking about much more monitoring uh, that has to be done. So if you think about then performance on the landscape scale, um, and some examples to matter, and that's a slide I borrowed from Peter Holmgren, we have to then actually think about something to measure and monitor that is easy to understand, that applies to any scale and any location that can actually be done, and that can be done not only once, but sustainably. So if you think about, for example, the different objectives like livelihood provisions, sustained ecosystem services, pollution and resource efficiency, and food and non-food products. On the outside, you see some examples of things that could serve as, well, at least simple or starting proxies uh, for these different dimensions of red plus in the landscape performance. In terms of livelihoods, it can be related to uh, amount earned or return, or things like GDP. In terms of ecosystem services, the tons of biomass in the landscapes. In terms of pollution and resource efficiency, the amount of CO2 um, emitted, or the, to uh, the tons of products delivered in both in food and non-food con context. So it is one important objective also for the monitoring community to take these multiple dimensions into account to assess the impacts of Red Plus also in a broader context. So this idea of having simple, measurable things is at the core of that. And as Arvid mentioned, some of you have been aware or are aware that three days ago a, a paper came out in Science uh, by Matt Hansen and colleagues that looked at or that provided a global 
uh, an annual assessment of forest cover gains and losses for 2000 to 2012. And this is the map that has been pro produced. In fact, you can view it on the, on the web. And the, one of the questions is, so is that one of these simple indicators that we can use to help us to monitor um, Red Plus on the landscape scale? Well, first of all, what you see is, from a very broad perspective, where do you see the most red dots on this map? The ones I see mostly are in the Canada and somewhere in Russia. All right? Those are the ones that I, that, that I pick, pick up. And in Canada, those are, or also in Russia, those are mostly fires. All right? Those are fires that have basically reduced uh, the forest cover and has, that, that's, that's when P picked up. And in Canada, it's also linked to harvesting op operations. The things that have been, those are plantations, things that have been uh, uh, harvested and replanted as part of rotational harvesting cycles. So it is a measure of forest cover gains and losses. It doesn't tell us very easily what is actually behind that. Besides analysis like this, because the detail of these analysis is quite good. It's 30 meters spatial res resolution. This is very detailed. It's the scale that we are thinking in terms of landscapes and human interactions with the landscape. So in that sense, it has the right thing. And in fact, it is an advertisement of what remote sensing and global remote sensing can actually do today. We do have to be careful when interpreting these things. For example, gross forest cover loss, so the loss of forest can be natural causes, it can be human causes, it can result in land use change, it can regenerate to forest, it can succeed to non-forest. So the, the signal that we get in terms of forest cover gain and loss is not easily attributed to specific human activities, which is, in my sense, a problem when it comes to assessing landscape scale performance, because Red Plus, for example, is about human-induced changes. So it is an interesting measure, and it is, provides a consistent global picture, um, but it will have limitations, or people have to understand the limitations of apply, using the data and applying the data for a specific frame, for a specific context, for a specific accounting framework, for, ex, for example. And so uh, the paper doesn't, the, the, the scientists don't claim that what they're providing is deforestation, although sometimes uh, it, it is understood that, that way. So to sum, to sum up that landscape thinking is inherent to Red Plus, in particular now that we move to phase two and that this issue of addressing drivers and thinking about impacts in a broad, broader scale are really coming up. That national Red Plus monitoring goes beyond forests. Uh, it, it includes drivers, carbon, non-carbon benefits, and it has to provide some base to share benefits. Monitoring Red Plus landscapes has to look for simple and measurable indicators. And that is very important. And I see that as a charge for the monitoring com commun community. And one way that we start to have to provide an answer for that is because Red Plus is moving to phase two now uh, with the performance-based payment as part of the carbon fund or by, uh, for other donors that are now really starting to take shape. Thank you. So, can you hear on this? Yes. Um, I'm happy to introduce the next speaker, Fe, as I know her some, but her full name is Maria Fernanda Gebra. She's working at the, um, at the Rio, Federal University of Rio, yes. among other places, and also being actively involved in this project to update us on Brazil. So, welcome. Thank you, Arut. Uh, thanks, actually, to all the organizers for being here. It's a pleasure for me, and it's very inspiring to be in such a meeting, especially in this room, as Martin noticed. And hello, everyone. I'm here to present some of the social and political dimensions of financing, MRV, and benefit sharing in Brazil. And I will we'll start with some red context in Brazil. 
So in 2003, a group of NGOs proposed to the UNFCCC a compensated reduction uh, where developing countries would be compensated by emissions reduction from deforestation. At the same time, the government of Brazil started to construct the plan to reduce deforestation called PPC Down, which was published in the next year, in 2004. After that, in 2006, the government of Brazil proposes to the UNFCCC a voluntary regime for RED. In 2007, a group of NGOs signed a zero deforestation pact and promoted it in the National Congress. And at the same time, the state of Amazonas created the Bolsa Floresta program. In 2008, the government launched the National Climate Plan, the National Plan for Climate Change, also created the Amazon Fund, and the first red project started to be implemented, the Juma project in the state of Amazonas. In 2009, the government launches the National Policy for Climate Change, establishing voluntary targets for mitigation. And also, uh, the, go the governments of Amazon, they start the Amazon Governance Governors Forum. In 2010, uh, we submit some national mitigation actions to the UNFCCC. Also, the Minister of Environment creates different working groups to start debating the Red National Strategy. A group of NGOs led by Ima Flora uh, Institute Research Institute in Brazil created the principle and criteria for RED. Also, the government launched two important plans, one to reduce deforestation in the Cerrado, is the equivalent of PPC Dan, is the PP Cerrado, and also the plan to reduce emissions from, from, agric from the agriculture sector, the ABC plan. Finally, in 2011, uh, the government created the Interministerial Working Group for RED to discuss the national strategy. And also, we had some the RED and PES bills being discussed and some meetings to start constructing the safeguard systems. System, sorry. In 2012, last year, the straight states created a task force for RED. Also, the government made available the first draft of, of the national strategy for civil society and the uh, FIP investment plan from the forest investment program uh, was approved for Brazil. And also, the last version of the forest code was published by the government. Finally, this year, we proposed for the NFCCC uh, some uh, guidance on, on red uh, technical issues in Bonn. And we have many subnational initiatives, including state laws on red, and also more than 50 projects that relate to red being implemented in Brazil. And this is uh, a figure of some, some uh, scenarios for future deforestation if all these actions weren't in place. So this is what would happen from 2006 until 2050. Main, mainly the deforestation, of course, uh, near the rivers and the roads. So from the draft of the national strategy, and this is, this is being discussed between the ministries and is led by the Minister of Environment, so it may change. But the main objectives would be reducing, deforest, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation by 2020, according uh, with what is established by the National Policy for Climate Change. Also achieve zero net deforestation in 2020. Maintain and restore ecosystem services and other functions of forest ecosystems. And also promote the sustainable development of regions with forests. So going to the financial mechanisms, at the national level, we have the Amazon Fund, which receives donations from Norway, Petrobras, and the government of German. And also the National Climate Fund, created by the National Policy for Climate Change, which receives donations from Petrobras as well, which is our national agency for oil exploitation. 
At the subnational level, we have some states' climate funds, such as the state of Amazonas fund. Also, we have some agreements between states, such as the Acre and California agreement, and some, some local funds being developed, such as the Surui fund and the São Félix do Xingu fund. And there is also the Biodiversity Fund, which receives donations from Jeff, the Amazon Fund, and others, and some public bu budget being available for REDS as well. At the international level, from the, the bond proposal that Brazil submitted in the middle of this year, uh, Brazil is betting pretty much in the Cre Green Climate Fund, and it suggested two ex-ante financing, one for directed for the national governments, another one directed to other actors and sub subject to a non-objection procedure by national authorities. And finally, a po a ex post payments to be disbursed according to mi mitigation results. Neither of these options preclude or nor exclude others according to the proposal submitted, including market-based approaches, but they say in the proposal that these discussions are not yet mature and need common understanding at the international level. The proposal also suggests a national authority that would uh, be responsible for the, the, um, to recommend proposals and consult other uh, proposals, and also be responsible for presenting proposals under modality A of, the green, the, of what they suggested for the Green Climate Fund, and applying for grants under modality C and for the no objection procedure under modality B. This national authority would work in close coordination with other national authorities and maybe even the same if appropriate. In terms of monitoring, Brazil is one of the most advanced countries in the world in capacity to monitor its forests using remote sensing and GIS technologies. At the national level, we have the National Institute for Special Research with four different initiatives to monitor deforestation and degradation, including uh, one which is the projects that they launched um, recently an uh, emission model to monitor emissions, uh, GHG emissions as well, and also the National Institute for Environment producing also data on, on deforestation levels at the national level. And at the subnational level, we have partnerships between the Minister of Environment and states. At the local level, we have the partnership between Surui and Google to monitor the Surui lands and other initiatives by the civil society institutions such as Imazon, IPAN, and the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Going to reporting, uh, the bond proposal made the, in the middle of this year established is that reference levels would be determined by a focal point at the national level, but following UNFCCC decisions. And also, this would be based on projected emissions for 2020 determined by the National Policy for Climate Change. And these emissions were projected based on deforestation, historical deforestation levels. Results would be approved at national level first and then at the international level. And consultation process and analysis would occur at national level, but with greater detailing at the international level. Verification and performance. For Brazil, verification is to ensure transparency and funding. So the government believe that, believes that verification is therefore domestic, and this generated a great discussion in the last COP in Durban, where Brazil was ar arguing that no developing country will have international verification of its actions because it could cause disadvantages against other sections and also add some additional obligations, and I think Erud can give some inputs on that, as the main opposer to this position was Norway, and they were arguing that they were willing to pay as long as they could be sure that they are paying for actual emissions reductions. I'm not sure if this discussion was solved already by, the, by this meeting now, but I, I hope it will at some point. 
And the indicator would be the tone of CO2 equivalent maintained or reduced, and this would be verified by a technical scientific committee at the national level created by the national strategy. And they consider, they, they believe it's possible to consider other indicators, but it still lacks a wider global debate. They also proposed in Bonn an international verification tool which wouldn't be centralized and results after being endorsed by COP. They would be published at the UNFCCC website indicating the country, the year, the reference levels and if the country was paid or not. And also for them, international level results-based payments can, can best occur using a national jurisdiction such as ref scale um, as reference, sorry, and, but in an interim basis, subnational reference levels could also be used. So the way the, the, this draft of the strategy relates MRV and, and finance is in financing is like they, they suggest the creation of uh, executive authority at the national level. Uh, which would be responsible for approving the MRV process and reporting back to investors. And also they would generate a red unit, and this unit would be, would be the one responsible for payments by results. And this would allow the financing process. And also after that, the resources would be distributed by, to beneficiaries. So going to benefit sharing at the international level, Brazil believes it should be determined independently to recognize the whole of different sectors. And in, in relation to the Green Climate Fund, they suggested that disbursements should occur based on total results over a period of time rather than in a fixed monetary value. At the national level, they don't, the government don't, doesn't have yet a clear position on how it works. They suggested the Amazon Fund as the main instrument. Also, they, they suggested the use of economic instruments and the, the decentralization from the Amazon Fund would occur uh, implementing new instruments and types of financing, but they were really, the, the strategy, this draft of the strategy is really vague and doesn't mention any examples of the economic instruments of these new instruments they aim to create. So I brought here some initiatives from the local level. I don't want to go through all of this because of time, but it's just to show uh, some examples and how projects are uh, investing resources in, in terms of benefits. And as you can see, there are many types of benefits. Some of them relate, some of them relate to readiness activities. And from the examples, uh, the examples I took, just one of them is using direct payments, which is the Bolsa Floresta program. Going to the safeguards, Brazil in 2010, as I mentioned in the, in the timeline, led by Ima Flora and, uh, and other groups of NGOs, they launched the red social and environmental principle and criteria, and it was constructed with uh, great participation from different actors from civil society, including local actors, and, and also it's been used as a, as a model by many countries and also by the Minister of, it's guiding the Minister of Environment debates on the construction of the, the system for safeguards. And from this debate, from these meetings that the Minister of Environment organized during 2011, there were some safeguards that were suggested to be included in the national strategy including governance, monitoring, transparency, benefit sharing, and others. The Amazon Fund also established some safeguards in accordance to the UNFCCC decision, but there is no monitoring of the implementation of these safeguards. So going to the conclusions, in terms of challenges, I would say the nesting activities from subnational and local levels to national level to guarantee accountability is one of the main challenges of Brazil. Also the attribution of results, how do we really link the MRV with the performance and the benefit sharing in order to have the results-based payment? improve monitoring and measurement of Amazon Fund results, and monitoring safeguards. 
And key lessons, I would say that advanced monitoring systems are not enough to guarantee performance. Therefore, performance indicators are critical. And we also need to think about the, the policy scape. And by that, I mean, like, it's really important to look at the landscape, but not alone. I think we should also look at the different, the, the mix of policies that are acting in a specific uh, landscape, especially when we deal with a, such a big country like Brazil. There is totally different, even in the Amazon, we have totally different realities. And I'll leave you with this picture uh, from an Indian trying to hit the development bank in Rio during the Rio Plus 20, because I think this reflects pretty much this conflicts of red implementation, because this bank is the one responsible for managing the Amazon funds, but at the same time is responsible for uh, funding many of the initiatives that are causing deforestation in, in the Amazon and in other biomes. So that's, that's why I think it's really important to look at this policy scape and not be just uh, looking at the, the policy from the forest sector and try to look at the whole landscape and policy scape. Thank you. Thanks, Fernanda. Um, we're going to move from the largest rainforest country to the tallest country in the world. Of course, that's Nepal. Um, that's my students telling me that, okay, it's a small country, but at least we are the tallest. Um, Naya Pandal, you're working with Forest Action in Nepal and been involved in much of the red activities and also the GSS project, so welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ariel, and welcome, everyone. Um, as uh, Nepal is not yet uh, there in terms of developing its um, MRV and uh, other uh, required studies like reference and other thing, and it's just developing its uh, red national red strategy, but uh, many of the knowledge gaps are still there. Um, so we are much behind in terms of, uh, no, uh, sharing the experience of landscape level um, activities in terms of MRV. Um, so what I would uh, bring um, you here is a more kind of a process, uh, particularly starting from Nepal's very successful community forestry and other community-based natural resource management schemes um, at the community level, at watershed level, and slightly moving up to the landscape level and how does those lessons from the natural resource management conservation can be actually um, feed in to the development of MRB. So that would be my emphasis. Um, particularly bringing two cases. One, um, the experimentation or practice with the natural resource management, and second, um, some of the piloting with the RAID and also PACE, and then drawing lessons um, from those practices. Um, I will start uh, from community forestry, because this is the, the I think, only area which we can confidently you know, say it as we have done something good in Nepal, otherwise in terms of politics, economy, we are in a failed state almost, um, and for last 10 years of political conflict, violent conflict, and then followed by almost uh, four or five years of a still ongoing political transition, uh, waiting for another election and waiting for a new constitution. So, so it's the only um, proud thing that um, we can share. And uh, the, the community forestry in Nepal is not only in terms of coverage of the population, also in terms of its uh, economic and social and uh, environmental benefits, um, but also uh, it provides a lot of other lessons to um, generate uh, or to build on um, either for raid or climate adaptation or other democratic processes, starting from these uh, grassroots emerging institutions. Um, why uh, this is so uh, strong uh, community forestry experience there is primarily it has a very strong uh, policy and legal foundations, very robust institutions at the grassroots level, 
Um, and the, the institution and the policy and legal framework fits very much with a kind of traditional uh, socio-ecological setting of the country. Um, that's why it has been very successful, and I think we can learn a lot from this experience, uh, particularly in the context of RAID ads. Ad, um, through RAID, we certainly wanted to protect forest and reduce emission. Um, but we, moving up from these uh, small forest patches that are managed by small uh, communities, uh, we also have uh, experience of this is a managing uh, watershed um, or a small protected area. Um, there are several examples starting from late 80s and 90s, um, but we have um, observed some um, asymmetry you know, in terms of uh, managing these watershed, uh, particularly asymmetry in terms of the political and administrative unit and also the civic institutions are on the one hand, and the second hand, we have these ecological units, ecological boundaries. Uh, two of them doesn't fit quite, um, but uh, at least in terms of these, these uh, uh, watershed management, we are trying to develop uh, institutions at that level, um, which are, in a way, federated local institutions uh, or coordination among government agencies and government agencies and private agencies and civic agencies. Um, but still, there are some um, gaps and in terms of the institutional robustness and also in terms of the environmental gain, um, these are not that much successful as we have community forestry. Um, but moving up from these uh, watershed level uh, experiences, we also have uh, several projects uh, in terms of trying to manage the resources uh, at the landscape level. Uh, so both in the northern, I'm just trying to juxtapose these two here, two different maps, which doesn't fit well. Um, but there are some landscapes where uh, different conservation uh, projects are uh, operating this time. Um, but we can see these uh, red little bits down there in the uh, western side, which are protected areas and some corridors and then other settlements. And you can see uh, this area is divided into different uh, political and administrative units, and the, the, there is no institution at the landscape level, either political level or the administrative level or at the civic level. Um, so because there are no, or, or there are differences, or there are asymmetries between these political, administrative, and civic institutions and the initiative to manage this landscape level resources. Um, mostly these are managed by you know, central level entities and trying to pull people from different uh, sectors and then set up some kind of project management committee, steering or, or coordinating. Um, but these institutions doesn't fit well with the existing institutions there. So there are some level of um, latent uh, conflict or a lack of coordination or lack of authority exists there. So um, when we go up from these small patches of community managed forest to watershed to landscape level, um, certainly we have faced a different institutional challenges. And when we go up to the national level, I'm just bringing up here uh, one of the recent analysis on the drivers of deforestation in Nepal, uh, which shows a range of proximate drivers up there and then underlying causes of drivers. Uh, and uh, given the Nepalese governing, government's capacity to deal with these various economic and socio, um, social or policy or corruption oriented and other uh, issues, um, it looks like that the government will almost uh, be uh, unable to address the drivers at the national level. So there is a, uh, a, an implicit uh, tendency from within the government that we may not uh, be able to address uh, the drivers at national level. So um, we should find some particular landscape where we can better focus or strategize our whole resources and efforts so that we can show some results. So the complexity of drivers and the, the complexity of dynamics 
um, has also you know, kind of uh, encouraged government to take these uh, landscape approach, but then there are still some challenges. Now I will start slightly go to the red piloting. Well, in terms of the national policy process, um, the government is, we have uh, this uh, red cell within the Ministry of Forest, and this uh, particular uh, entity is coordinating uh, national red readiness process uh, through the support of World Bank FCPF program. And all, there are also other agencies working in the periphery, um, but the process is very slow, and we are not yet in the um, second phase. We are still in the first phase. But uh, there are parallel piloting going on at the watershed level, uh, where um, some kind of experimentation is going on on benefit sharing, uh, creating some kind of uh, forest carbon trust fund, and then the national advisory committee there, and then down we have this uh, um, watershed level um, red net, um, and then down trying to bundling a number of community forest user groups, which are a small patches of 200 hectares, 300 hectares, 50 hectares. The average size of Nepalese community forests are uh, 85 hectares. So trying to bundling these different uh, groups into that uh, watershed level network, and then um, trying to develop uh, monitoring and uh, uh, benefit sharing uh, within that uh, watershed level. Uh, but then, we have um, observed a, a number of challenges at the uh, landscape level initiative in uh, piloting red, uh, particularly when um, the new institution um, that was introduced uh, as a part of coordinating body of these local uh, groups. So the, the introduction of these groups uh, has created a slight uh, latent tension with the existing ones because the existing uh, system is not operating at the watershed level. It has, uh, the, the administrative unit is at the national level, the district level, and the local level. The watershed level doesn't fit uh, either in the district or in the local level, so it, it is in, somewhere in between. Um, so these uh, watershed level units, they can't coordinate with the district level, um, they can't uh, fit at the local level, so there is some kind of misfit between the existing political administrative units and the ecological units that we are trying to experiment with. Um, there is similar another uh, piloting uh, on payment for environmental services um, in one of the uh, hydropower scheme. Um, so we have this hydropower scheme um, that pays um, 12% uh, of its uh, revenue um, to the local governments, uh, and then out of that, 20% uh, goes to the upstream communities, and the whole intent is to protect the watershed um, upstream of the hydropower. But uh, because of the existing legal system, the money goes through local government to the village development committees, which are the local governments at the lowest level, and these bodies would spend that money particularly in construction road, and which is one of the key drivers of deforestation and causing siltation and sedimentation. So the whole purpose of uh, protecting the watershed is not working here. So with these um, two you know, kind of uh, piloting, um, both at the raid uh, and also in the, for the pace, we can see that the very grassroots level institution, community forestry organization or other community-based organization, they are functioning very well. Um, but once you gradually go up from that level, um, there are some challenges in terms of the institutional robustness, in terms of the symmetry between the existing uh, political and administrative units and the new institution that we are promoting and also the kind of uh, needed coordination um, between different institutions. Now in this context, the government is also trying to develop uh, a project at the landscape level. While the national process is going on, it, it is also you know, encouraged by uh, a certain, um, I, th I think, part of the support from the World Bank, 
um, is going to, you know, is developing a project at the watershed level, uh, le sorry, landscape level. Um, but um, I see some uh, problems there. One, um, because there are no institutions at the landscape level uh, to actually define the tenure to maintain the data, to monitor and maintain the data, and to actually one and uh, uh, kind of take the accountability or responsibility to protect or, or to manage sustainability of that area. Um, so the, the pace of piloting uh, or, or going through this uh, landscape level project and the actual preparedness in terms of the institutions and uh, uh, other preparedness is not there yet. Um, so some of the messages from my uh, presentation here based on the community forestry and watershed level management and in landscape level management and the rate piloting um, is that the, the local level institutions which are very strong, robust and managing forest well for the last 20, 30 years. So how can we build on from that local level experience when we go up, upper level, higher level, without losing the institutional robustness, without losing the tenure security, without losing the kind of ownership that the communities and other institutions are taking up. So that is one challenge I can see. The second, um, when most of these conservation initiatives uh, went up to the higher level and the word, the landscape is being used just to, just to refer that the uh, larger scale of resource, but not adequately you know, bringing up the diversity of actors and institutions and dynamics which actually we would like to see within the landscape debate. So that it's because the drivers of forest, uh, sorry, deforestation are not only within the forest sector and that are other strong actors. So how to integrate these different actors at a landscape level so that we can have a better or successful rate. So I think um, the, the simple um, one conclusion I would like to draw is when we move towards a, a landscape-based rate, uh, we must focus adequately on the institutional aspects, whether that can support landscape level or not. Thank you. Thank you. Just to be reminded that about the cards where you can write questions, if you would like to, or send it more in the... In the Is it working? Yeah. So, tweeting DF3, hashtag DF3, plus this GLF COP19 hashtag also. Or the sheets if you would like to, to write, but there will be a Q&A session just after this. So, let me introduce Daniel Murdiaso, a red guru from Indonesia. And guru in Indonesian means teacher. And he's not just a guru, he's a big teacher, Guru Besar, which is professor of meteorology also and has been a long time involved in both the MRV work and red work in general in Indonesia and the policy process and from a more scientific point of view. So an excellent background for your presentation on the MRV and performance-based systems in Indonesia. Welcome. Well, thank you, Ariel. Uh, talking about guru, I'm also talking about students, which uh, really associated with this room, Martin Sen said about the sentiment about the room. When I was a student, the room was like this, uh, in a sense of the flipping seat you have. And that also signify when the students were satisfied with the lecture and it was not so depressing, they can squeeze, move out the room very quietly. But if it is very depressing, they can go out and bang the seat. So um, I will MRV you the way you, you bang the seat when you leave the room. <laughs> anyway, so the talk I'm going to share with you here is uh, our observation as far as Indonesia is concerned in implementing RED. But uh, putting a landscape into the context is, is quite a challenge. 
Uh, it is an ongoing kind of process, very quick and, and um, fast process in the past uh, six or seven years or so. Okay, so I will uh, set the scene by telling the story about the forest governance in Indonesia and then the way RED was uh, accepted and, and uh, processed at national and subnational level in, in the last few years and how can, I think this is the, 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 uh, the topic of the day, how the MRV is um, really presented so that the credibility is secured and in a broader scale, it's not project but landscape level. And then uh, the story about the uh, financing, which is still a work in, in progress at the moment, and um, it's also associated and closely related to what is being discussed and negotiated in, in Warsaw here. And we, we will um, take some uh, message home, what's, what's is happening uh, after this, and expectedly, especially if there are colleagues from Indonesia or those who are working in Indonesia can uh, have some, some lessons here. It's a long story of uh, forest governance in Indonesia. It uh, started off back in the 70s. It's very much uh, centralized, governed by national law, very strong, and included in that process is the permitting and issuance of, of license. So a lot of uh, activities going on in the 70s, the 80s, very fast uh, deforestation occur uh, for the development of the national economy. So forestry has been the backbone of, of national economy in the past 20 years. Uh, the national revenue is somewhere around six or seven billion US dollar a year coming from forestry sectors uh, related activities. And uh, of course, most of the activities are goods related um, activities. Um, services is not there in, in the agenda. Even climate change is way from uh, the forestry activities in Indonesia. And then very recently in the early 2000s, uh, the um, Governance is very much uh, decentralized, but of course, uh, without problem. There's a lot of problem with regard to the capacity in the regional or district governance. Uh, a lot of issuance of uh, permits of uh, forest-related activities issued by the local government. And with low capacities in doing that, of course, the, the associated uh, calamities, including uh, emission of greenhouse gases, is, is extensive. It's happened everywhere in the region. The use of fire is, is very prominent, and um, as the local government is trying to, to catch up with what is going to happen in, in the local level. And it leaves a lot of gaps in terms of capacity in, in various uh, aspects, and Looking at forests in the landscape now, is it going to be forests in the future? This kind of setting in the landscape is, is being discussed now where the oil palm will be part of forests. So it's, it's a huge challenge as far as research and also the implementation by, by local government, the player, the private sector, looking at the changing landscape in Indonesia where uh, most of the development are based on forests and forest land, which is at the moment governed by one single ministry. So when RED was introduced, uh, a lot of actors uh, play in the role, and uh, various in uh, initiatives was uh, implemented, including very early stage of multilateral engagement with, with donors to try to understand what was the underlying causes of deforestation. People start to consult with each other. A lot of activities going on with regard to trying to understand what RED is all about. And that started off soon after uh, Montreal when RED with single 1D was discussed. 
So basically, people were talking about deforestation or even avoiding deforestation. So uh, various sectors within forestry was trying to understand what is the implication for plantation, what's the implication for pulp industry, oil palm expansion, and also agricultural sectors. And then the activities gear up towards a better understanding of real activities to try to help the deforestation by developing the so-called demonstration activities, try to understand what is the baseline was from the previous experience when the CDM was implemented. Is it the same? Uh, exactly the opposite. The baseline is trying to measure the uh, addition of, of uh, carbon in the landscape while CDM was trying to understand the reduction. And then safeguard was also discussed during the implementation of the so-called Kalimantan Forest Carbon Partnership supported by Australia and also UN Red in various uh, districts in Indonesia. And then uh, even uh, dealing with uh, Norway uh, was very uh, monumental in terms of involvement of stakeholders while carrying the experience from various initiatives. A lot of things happened in the past three, four years when the letter of intent between Indonesia and Norway was signed. Uh, activities including the development of national red strategies, very intense consultation, uh, development of pilot province, whether it was pilot or district, it's a big debate about that in the process. And then the um, MRV and finance uh, mechanism. So in the past six or seven years, uh, the, the, the curve of the learning is really very steep and people are confused, people are understand better and various different kind of, of, of interest in, in that process. And it's getting bigger and bigger in terms of involvement or interaction between agencies, individual, NGO, and, and also private sector. So at the moment, uh, people are waiting for what's going to happen here in Warsaw or 2015 with regard to MRV and the, the mechanism, the modalities or red will be implemented. In, the onset of this process, the uh, National Red Strategy was published uh, last year, and it contains exactly what we are discussing here, looking at red not only from project-based activities, but very much looking at landscape level. It's not forestry-oriented only. It's looking at other activities dealing with sustainable development at landscape level, but still trying to understand how to, to move this beyond uh, what is currently or business as usual implementation in forestry sector. So with the uh, development or establishment of the Red Agency very recently, uh, this process will likely going to move forward and the MRV institution will be in place to help out with the process of financing the Red activities. So, um, at the same time, um, a lot of project activities going on in the region um, while the capital, the central uh, government is busy with that process in developing the strategy. A lot of activities in Sumatra, in Kalimantan, and also in the eastern part of Indonesia, even in, in very uh, less, uh, least forest cover region. Uh, Red-related activities are going, uh, are happening. So, how about the MRV in these various projects with different stage of development, different capacity, different uh, way of doing it, different uh, partners? That's what the Red Agency is going to tackle in the near future. And uh, as far as MRV system is concerned. The main issue here, while, while we are here in Warsaw being discussed here, is the, the credibility how the measurement is really following the rule 
and it is uh, secured in terms of methodology, in terms of the numbers. We are talking about the politics of number, um, which reference level is going to be used. That's uh, highly debated at the moment. Uh, when people talk about deforestation rate of, I don't know, 2.3, 1.5 million hectares and the government number is about 1.6 and then recent publication and as it was mentioned is almost three times higher in terms of deforestation rate. While it's a good proxy in terms of what's happening on the ground, the, the deforestation rate, but more important is the emission rate because most of Indonesian forestry sector activities right now is happening in peatland. Out of 20 million uh, hectares of peatland, only 3 million are protected. So the rest, the majority of it is already licensed. So sooner or later, this ecosystem will be converted for something else in the landscape. And the emission is no longer uh, sensitive to area, but the intensity of carbon in that landscape. So looking at peatland, is very strategic. Looking at high carbon uh, reservoir is very important in order to have a better MRV and credible MRV. And again, the, the estimate so far is based on mainly stock chains. When, when it is going to be improved, uh, flux approach would be desirable. Of course, the IPCC is, is not meant for developing project. It is, it is a tool to do the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory, but at least the good practice guidance is there that countries can refer to so that the, the credibility of MRV can be uh, contested. So as far as the financial mechanism is concerned, it is an ongoing uh, progress uh, looking at the financial financing rate in Indonesia is called FREDI. So it's like the Amazon fund. It's, it's a grant making, it's a trust fund. And um, basically it's not one single source of funding to, to develop this project. It's multiple and a broad array of activities and opportunities from small scale community base to large scale uh, corporate operation, etc. The, the good thing of this uh, framework is that it, is, it has a guiding principle uh, and safeguard is included in that uh, mechanism and uh, the governance system is, is, is secured by the, the presence of what is going to be the board of trustees of this Freddy. So how the, the benefit will be shared? That's a, a big question. So with regard to different size, different modalities of project on the ground, um, it has been discussed the possibility of using the so-called nesting approach. If there are various projects in various sub-national level, it's got to have a MARVI system on its own. It might have different reference level or using national reference level and then compare the performance based on the national reference so that the, the crediting or debiting of carbon can be, can be made. Uh, the question here is how one will have to attribute this. So attribute, attribution is, is a big question here. Right, so is nesting like this going to be the, the likely uh, process? It looks very fragile but it will deliver if someone is going to, to do the right thing, it will deliver the offspring. Or is it going to be very rigid, very um, uh, jurisdictional in terms of boundary, which might also uh, create some challenges in terms of attribution. So still going on how the distribution or sharing of the benefit will be. So the key message to take home here is that we should not wait. The momentum is there and Indonesia can proceed with the existing rules if it is going to be a kind of um, 
example, the, the IPCC can, can be the, the surrogate of the process. And if that is the case, countries has the experience. There are a lot of people who have the experience of being the uh, national, uh, what do you call it, uh, data uh, compiler in terms of sectoral emissions, including forestry sector. So numbers are there. Uh, it's a matter of securing or, or promising the credibility. So nested approach might be um, the way of, of paying or sharing the benefit, but it's a lot of thing need to be thought about it. Thank you. Thanks to Daniel. Um, we're going to open up the floor in just a few minutes, depending on how long, but I just want to have a small first round of questions that I that came up as we were talking here to, to each of the three or four speakers. It's important to know how to count. Uh, as they say, there, there are three types of people in the world, those that can count and those that cannot count. Um, Martin, I just wonder, you have worked in a number of countries on MRV in Guyana and advised, for example, and, and several other countries, but I, I just, and for many of these countries, we're starting really from scratch. So my question, my simple question is to you, what could have been done more? And you can maybe take some examples. What could the countries and the donors and others have done more if we had better monitoring systems in place? How has that hindered us? So what could you have done differently if it was? So what has been the cost of not having invested more in that for decades? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, the first red plus phase, as it called, is called readiness, was really the objective is just to get countries ready and started um, to move eventually to phase two, which I think we are now on the, on the edge of moving to phase two. Um, and one of these investments that have been made in the readiness phase is to invest in monitoring capacities and improved data. Um, and take, for example, Guyana uh, as, as a case that had started with almost no systematic observations of the forest, uh, moved into an, a system where they went to annual reporting on forest-related uh, changes and related emissions to Norway, and is actually getting compensated based on that. One of the things um, that, and I've just been talking to Guyana uh, two weeks ago about this, and one of the discussions that came up, and it was when the person from the Guyana Forestry Commission told me, oh, you know what, our deforestation rate for mining went up last year, and, and, uh, and you know, we are really worried about this. And, uh, and I said, well, I mean, it's not good that your deforestation rate went up because of mining, but at least you have a tool that tells you that your deforestation rate goes up of mining. And then she said, yeah, and then there was all this public debate in the media and all of that, and I said, this is exactly what you want. If you have the information, if you have the data, that it's not only about deforestation, but it's about deforestation of mining. And we know it's not so easy to deal with the mining sector in some of these cases. That is the kind of tools that you have to actually start the engagement of multiple stakeholders, the public, of, of all kinds of actors to actually stimulate that debate. So this is a very important uh, lesson that at least I can share from the Guyana side. Um, what I see in country readiness, in country readiness plans as they were, and I, I think I showed the example of analyzing these in terms of how to address the drivers, is I think some of them could have gone a bit further in this thinking that I think we're discussing here today. So what are the drivers? What can we do about it? And who needs to be engaged and stimulated to participate in that? And that depending on the driver, usually requires a lot of broad thinking and, you know, multiple sectors and, 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 all, of, and all of that. And that is, I think, something that, um, uh, that, that still, some countries are at least a little bit behind of actually getting to that point. And that is because Red Plus was very much seen as a forest-related activity. Uh, and from a greenhouse gas point of view, it is still very much a forest-related activity. But from an implementation point of view, it is much broader. And I think that's where 
uh, more data on that or more information on how to link understanding of drivers to doing things differently uh, and to stimulate that, that transformational change, in fact, that is needed to make Red Plus work and that has multiple dimensions. And if you read some of the C4 publications on, on that, um, that's, I think, where monitoring could have done a bit better and actually so, and monitoring and using the data could have done a bit better on. Um, Fernando, we, I got a question on, on tweeted on hashtag DF3 to remind you, but in the context of, of RED and, and perhaps also MRV system that you have in place, how the, protect, the protection of the, of the land rights of indigenous communities, how that has been integrated and incorporated? In terms of MRV? Or in the context of maybe broader the RED, the, how protection of indigenous land rights, how they have, that has been taken into account? Yeah, in, indigenous rights are, are protected by the constitution. We have one of the most advanced constitutions in, in relation to indigenous rights. But recently, in, in the, this government, in the Dilma government, since 2010, we considered that there was a like going back because she, she wants to change some of, of the 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 norms that are in the constitution through some uh, measures that she can, uh, through decrees and, and specific presidential measures that she can do. And one of them is specific in relation to the demarcation of indigenous lands. So there, this was one of the, the reasons why uh, there were a lot of pro protests in, in Brasilia recently about this, uh, what they call the PAC, the amend to the Constitution, proposal amend to the Constitution. And, but it's still under debate. And going to the, to the red debate, I would say that um, there is an, uh, already some views from both from the FUNAI, which is the, the agency that, that regulates indigenous uh, that looks for the implementation of these indigenous rights, and they they actually uh, did um, like a, a statement saying that they believe that the carbon rights and and the right for negotiating this carbon uh, belongs to indigenous because of this constitution constitutional norms. And also there was also the, the public ministry, they also did a statement in relation to that because of some cases of carbon cowboys in Brazil in last year, 2012. And also they, they also considered the same opinion of UNAI where they should have these rights protected because they already have the, the, the right to, to the use of fruit of all the benefits of their lands uh, in the constitution, so that's why they they are they believe in this. Thanks, um, Naya. You come from uh, the birthplace of uh, community forest management, at least what that's what you claim, uh, and I think it's correct. <laughs> uh, just one, you said that the kind of interesting that that you have at the local level, you you have okay, decent, good institutions, and, and perhaps something at the top also, you are developing there, the national, but it's really at the intermediate, the landscape, the watershed level. So I thought, can you, can't you just scale up the community management, or cannot you? Are you looking for something really qualitatively different from, or is it just, as we also often see in the debate, why don't you just scale up community management? Or are you looking for something very different. Um, I think not completely different. Uh, there are some practices uh, where the community forestry managers, management not only operates in very small scale like 100 hectare, 2 hectare, 200 hectare. In some cases we have like 4,000 hectares uh, ma community managing and it's not only a few hundred families, 2,000, 3,000 households also managing. Um, but I think there is not adequate emphasis to look into it and learn from 
how the community forest user groups are making innovations in terms of managing the relatively larger landscape. And just we are trying to you know, copy from protected area system or the other system and not adequately you know, uh, looking at and then drawing lessons from community forest user groups and how these lessons can be scaled up. I think this is part of the government deliberative choice or the choice of other actors as well. So my point is, yes, there are lessons, not completely, we cannot completely replicate it, but certainly we can draw many of the things from these grassroots institutions and can build up um, to, to manage larger landscape. But certainly we need a more a stronger political will to recognize and to build on from there. Good. Daniel, Indonesia is a very diverse country also when it comes to national deforestation figures and national deforestation maps, and you have gotten some more maps recently. Now, and this has been a major issue, I know, in, in the Indonesian debate about different figures from the Ministry of Environment, Forestry, and so on. Now, is this a real problem, or is it a convenient excuse for, for not doing more? Well, I think two things here uh, associated with your questions. One is the history, as I said, uh, the way people perceive these activities is very much related to forestry sector. If you're implementing red deaths, that's forestry. That's the history. But changing the history overnight is, is impossible. And that is associated with the awareness about data and data uh, quality and also clarity. So everybody is, is trying to perform right because they use their own perspective in terms of deforestation rate because forest is defined as such and such from their perspective. Another perspective is defined different way. So the numbers come up with different figures. So moving from one history to another or mindset from one to another is an important step to make in order to uh, address the issue of landscape, the issue of productivity, the issue of climate change. So it's, it's not a simple answer. Uh, we have to agree on such and such hectare or million hectare per year or ton of CO2 per year, but let's come to a consensus what we mean by deforestation and which uh, definition of forest we are going to use. So set back a little bit and then we, we make a consensus. That's, that's my, my uh, suggestion. With the risk of sitting for a, a while and agreeing on, on data before you implement policies, is, 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 is that a real risk? That I mean you can, these discussions about, okay, was it 1.6 or 2 point whatever, and, and then that's delaying the whole policy process. I guess it already has done that. There's this number of political. So uh, if we are <laughs> settling with this, uh, there will be less noise later on. Mm. So it's, it's important to sit and set back a little bit and then and agree to, to agree. So sit back, but not for too long. Um, I would like to open the floor now for, for questions. Um, you know, I don't see very well. And also the cards that uh, we can uh, use and submit to those who walk around. At least we have one gentleman here. Hello, my name is Kriton Arsenis. I'm a member of the European Parliament, uh, the Rapporteur on Forest Protection and Lulucer. Um, we just decided in the European Parliament to allocate a fund of 1.2 million for research, very related to what we discussed here, how the absence of roads can lead, can work as an early success indicator for Red Plus projects. And uh, I would like to ask our, our friend, the, the scientist from Brazil, you said that all the upcoming deforestation is very related to roads and riverways. Has there been any discussion 
uh, of how you, will, you can address these uh, drivers of deforestation there. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think there are a lot of discussions, especially under of the Minister of Environment, but I don't know, I think since uh, the decade of seven, the 70s, there is always this conflict about development and conservation in relation to the Amazon. So at the same time that we, we have all that measures that I, I showed in the timeline and everything, we have other things going on in other sectors, especially in relation to infrastructure and also in the energy sector that are kind of uh, anti-mitigating these other measures from the forest sector. So at the same time that, that there are discussions, there is always the, the question about what is, what is more important, development or conserving the forest? So I think it's more or less that. And, and I don't know if you saw it, but recently there was this new about the, the levels of deforestation, the raise of the levels of deforestation. So it's mainly because of infrastructure projects as well. You happy with that? Um, any more questions? You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Till Nave. I have a question for uh, Daniel Modiarso. This is a question um, related to your presentation where you talked a lot about the nested approach and uh, where you showed the slide with all these projects that are already going on in Indonesia. And I wanted to pick up on um, one of the sentences that I've, on the, that I've seen on the last slide that you showed, where, you, where I believe you wrote that um, results-based payments through the nested approach may be feasible. I think you wrote may be feasible or something very similar. And what um, mo many of us like to read in that is, is that they are feasible. But what you're implying also is that they might just not be, be feasible. And, one of the other things that you said in your presentation is that there are uh, capacity gaps at places when it comes to greenhouse gas inventory systems at the regional levels. And um, I'm, I'm just wondering what you believe will happen in Indonesia during the next years. How likely is it that, um, that this famous multi-level MRV system would be built up that will allow for consistent estimates between national level, project levels, provincial levels? Or is it um, more that we are headed towards a situation where much of the investments that have already been undertaken with the projects are likely to just go out of the window. Thank you very much. Right, well, the key message I put up there is very much related to your questions with regard to the various uh, type and, and size and also initiative on the ground. Because there will be, uh, people imagine there will be no uh, single bullets that will, you know, uh, satisfy all these different um, model and no one size fits all for all. So that's why the, the Freddy scheme is trying to be very flexible at the onset and perhaps it will take the shape uh, in few years until they really learn the lessons from what's, what's really the real project is on the ground because with regard to that uh, demonstration activities, most of them are locally initiated um, and very likely they have no um, sustainability in terms of continuing with the project. And um, it has to be, to be tackled very carefully compared with, for example, the bigger one with large investment, large support from bilateral uh, scheme and strong NGO to, to help. So the various kind of project that may uh, be able to enjoy the existing uh, interim Freddy scheme. But at the end of the day, there should be a uh, system that can satisfy all these possibilities. The second question is not too clear for me. Can you, can you put it in a shorter version? Or anybody can help here? Do you
you want to, to take the short one liner of your question, the second question? It's okay. Um, I got one question from, from here on the floor, um, particularly Brazil and Nepal, where what you cover is mainly forest policy success stories prior to red. So, so the fundamental question is, is for example, well, in both countries, to, to how do you distinguish, is it really to the credit of, of red, and red may be understood as the international initiative starting from 2007 in Bali, COP in Bali. How do you distinguish, and, and is it really the, the good policies, or the, sorry, the, the positive development we have seen in particularly those two countries, can it be attributed to red, or is it more the accumulated long policy history? So maybe... No, for us, um, I think we don't have any direct uh, link with the red yet to measure the you know, forest improvement. It's is the 20, 25 years back community forest history started since late 80s, and the red piloting is just in a few well less than 100 community forest user groups out of 18,000 user group. Um, so, in terms of rate contribution to forest conservation, it's almost insignificant in that way, both because of, uh, both uh, due to the very small size and also be because of the very short history. Um, so, I, I think um, we can't link the, the community forestry and its development with the red. It's, it's long-term policy, legal, and uh, uh, certainly a, a lot of uh, international aid, support, and then a strong community institution that we can attribute. I think in the case of Brazil, uh, there, there is a link because as you saw in the timeline after RED, many policies came up in the national level and also the Amazon Fund was created after Bali and the national climate policy with, with uh, voluntary targets. I think it's all related to the, to the international level debate in general, not, not just with RED but the, the main emissions from Brazil come from deforestation, so this would be the link with RED, and also some, some of the, the plans that are included in the national climate policy, they were launched after RED, and there, there was this, uh, after the international discussions, they, they kind of like get kind of slowly as well in the national scenario. We saw this slowing, this slowing down in terms of decisions, important decisions. But uh, from uh, what I've heard from uh, a meeting that there were some government representatives there, they actually believe it, there is not a link with Fred. They believe it's more related to the historic uh, policy history, history of Brazil, and they, they also think they were already in the readiness phase before reading coming up in the international negotiations. So the, the first one is my personal opinion, the second one it's what the government thinks. Well, I presume you mainly represent yourself. Uh, thanks. Um, we can have some more questions. I have also a question here, but if some more from the floor. So one question to, to any who would like to answer here is about the, the, um, the, the question is this, how big an issue is the sufficiency of and predictability of funds, I mean international funds in the coming years, given that the funds internationally that have been committed are not fully, well, they, they are, not fully committed, they are more vague promises and we know that everything that is promised is, is not in the end delivered. Uh, and second, voluntary carbon markets, they are weak and, and volatile and, and to get a compliance market, it still hinges on we getting a, a good strong Paris protocol in 2015. Um, so the question is how big an issue is this and given that it may not come, the big funds that maybe one envisioned just a few years ago. How big an issue, I mean, to keep the momentum is to have the big international money flows to the countries. So I don't know, Daniel, if you would like to start. That's, that's a good thing of the landscape approach. 
So um, people like a gamble these days. So what's going to happen if nothing happened? And a lot of preparation has been done from both sides. Have, you know, spent a lot of time and, and money to prepare and get things ready. But the global process is declining or getting downward. So the, the landscape approach, and which is also in the document of the Indonesian Red Plus strategy, is looking at broader kind of views in terms of managing the landscape. So deforestation will continue, to my opinion, will take place, but maybe in, in different kind of way. And a development of land is still going on because most of the land have already been licensed, meaning that the tenure is, is there and it's, it's long-term tenure. So I think if the market, the carbon market swing towards red, uh, the, the current preparation should uh, quickly uh, adjust to the situation. And if it's not, mm. there is a no regret kind of policy with regard to landscape uh, uh, wide uh, policy in, in, in managing the land uh, nationwide. So uh, red plus is one of the components to reduce the emission. And again, specific for Indonesia, if, if peatland and mangrove, other uh, high carbon reservoir is managed properly or um, development is, is done carefully, the emission reduction target, which is the pledge of the nation, is, is very likely going to be achieved because this is the, the most important ecosystem that can contribute to that emission reduction target. The remaining land, like secondary forest, upland forest, is already gone in terms of carbon stock above the ground in terms of emission. But peatland, even though the, the forest is already gone, the emission is still taking place. How water regime will be managed, those, those kind of things are in the strategy. So if this kind of thing is implemented, whether or not there will be a red mechanism, the emission reduction will, will be achieved. Just a small story um, from Nepal. Um, Isimor has, uh, no, has had a piloting project in three different watersheds, and it provided, uh, uh, I think, uh, $100,000 to different three um, watersheds um, for three years. And now the project has uh, closed, and the people in the uh, in these watershed are now expecting you know, what would come next year. It's not only these uh, people in three watershed, but also other communities who are trying to get uh, local uh, technicians and measuring forest, um, you know, in taking forest inventory, and then um, you know, in a way waiting for more money to come in the community. And they don't know that uh, the EC mode project has uh, closed and the piloting, the communities in the piloting area are also not getting that. So, um, not only the people working in the piloting area, they are terrible in a difficult position, including Ishimoto's friends, but also people working in other areas, they are uh, now facing a, a kind of uh, challenge. Um, so, what you tell to the communities tomorrow, uh, if the money is not going to come. So, I think it's, we are already creating a huge expectations um, among the communities, and possibly we will will all, particularly those working on the very direct interface with the communities, would be in trouble. Would you like to say something brief? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Um, okay, um, I got a few more, more pink, looks like love letters, but they're quite boring. <laughs> boring questions compared to the reference level, reference letter. Um, just one question for Indonesia or for Daniel. You, Europe's, I mean, everybody represents themselves here and our researchers, not the government. Um, but you talked about uh, many sources of funding for a nested approach. Uh, we would like whether you also have established system for to raise funds from national sources to fund that, that would meet the cost of building this capacity for long-term MRV. So it comes from the, mobilizing national resources for 
for MRV for the cost of that, what you have done in that area? Well, th with the various source of funding uh, in vision, this trust fund will likely to uh, pioneer or um, start jump start with what is happening on the ground. Maybe with something uh, quick and, and dirty thing, but uh, certainly will be a lot of lesson to learn in terms of financing mechanism. Mm. Uh, as I said, it is still ongoing uh, work uh, with regard to uh, how to finance the activities related to the MRV. So the, the numbers got to be right here, and, and the monitoring aspect is very, very key to, um, to get the numbers right. So capacity building in that area is, is very crucial in, in various levels, including the small scale. I, I didn't mention much about the small scale activities. Uh, usually it's been alienated in terms of well, if you do it with the local community, it's going to be cheap. I don't, I don't believe that. Um, cheap in terms of what? In terms of measuring the, the, the diameter of trees? Maybe not. But in terms of their involvement, their ownership, their um, sense of belonging is, is going to be tedious and could be expensive. The tenurial system should be secured. So if, if they are measuring something, they are measuring their own thing, not somebody else's. Mm. So that kind of capacity need to be in place. Just keep the microphone. Um, the oral exam continues. And I want a yes or a no answer to this question. Now in Indonesia and Brazil and Nepal, all these countries, uh, you had a number of red projects. Have these projects had an impact and made a difference? Yes or no? Or. <laughs> it's like another exam in here. Uh, maybe, perhaps. Year one. No, but uh, a little bit more elaborated. Well, certainly people uh, start to talk with each other, asking what RED is all about, at least. In the, in the old days, uh, people don't, don't talk. You know, if, if you're talking about national level, Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Forestry, they don't talk about common language and, and other ministries. And also at local level, especially when the authority is, is decentralized, this is a new kind of burden, quote unquote, for them. And, and try to understand the language of people from, from Jakarta, from the capital, what, what is this? They're, they're busy in implementing their day-to-day -day activities, but it's a new agenda of climate change. But this uh, event make them realize that one has to talk with each other. So yes, it makes change in that sense. So if I were to translate it for my grandmother, it would be something like, um, well, I hope and think it will make a difference in the not so far future, but it's hard to s say that it has done it so far. Something like that. Um, Maybe in Nepal, has red made a difference? Uh, made a difference in terms of uh, you know, um, awareness raising, uh, particularly bringing the issue of tenure rights of uh, indigenous people, of women, of different sections of community, um, because of a lot of uh, grassroots uh, capacity building type of activities. Yes, this has not been adequately um, conducted within, before red. Um, so with RAID, a lot of different, these are small projects, um, so that kind of awareness and knowledge and information, that has gone down to the community level, yes. Um, but I think the, the most beneficiary, you, know, you can remember last time in Oslo, I was saying that the readiness process is uh, particularly for the Kathmandu-based NGO and couple of government people and consultants, they have benefited most than others, but also to some extent communities, yes. I think in the case of Brazil, of course, it's always difficult to say because these projects, they have more or less like three years or something and, and you can't really measure impact. But 
Uh, I would say that uh, for the subnational level, I think they, they kind of pushed uh, the state governments to, to uh, create some laws to reduce deforestation. But at the same time, these this, this policies, they don't really create uh, new incentives and, and different instruments to, to reduce deforestation. They just, they are very, very general and, and they aim uh, uh, to, to create uh, more resources for reducing deforestation, but they don't really create incentives, they don't really specify and they, they don't, I think they don't create the transformational change Martin mentioned here. So uh, I, I would say it's, it's more like a band-aid than, than really going to, to the real problem and, and changing behavior. And, and this, this would be my, my, things about, my thoughts about the impact. I would Yeah, maybe it's, it's uh, important to mention also from national level, a big change happened back home in Indonesia with regard to the ruling of the customary land uh, very recently by the uh, Constitutional Court. This is the highest uh, possible process that you can expect. Uh, in the law of forestry, it has been mentioned and always believed that Customary land is state land, but it's been overruled. That, so that's, that's a big change. So, and this process happened when we are discussing red nationwide. Secondly, on, on the issue of uh, the possibility of probing corruption. Again, uh, the, the anti-corruption commission is involved in this process. So there is, there is a, a way of... Uh, looking at forest governance in, in different perspective with regard to the issuance of permits and things like that. And when the red is discussed at national level, this thing come up in the, in, in the picture. So yes, it makes a lot of difference. Thanks. Um, some of you are, I mean, it's been two long days and maybe weeks for some, so I, I think we'll wrap up maybe a little bit before in about 10 minutes or so. so. Um, so you can start the countdown. Um, I have one question here from the floor. Uh, Chris Meyer from the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, and a couple questions. I was just wondering, when I saw landscape, I thought jurisdictions. Is that, are we talking about the same thing here or is that something different? I mean, it was interesting, I think, the comments from Nepal, of course, on how to symmetrical aligning of, let's say, different ecosystems with political boundaries. Uh, second, I really enjoyed uh, Maria, your, your presentation, uh, very good overview of the Brazil proposal, and uh, I, what, what caught my eye about there is you, you also talked about how there's 50 different projects being developed in Brazil, but then, then Brazil has also said there's going to be one focal point that would be handling all money, MRV reporting, etc. for the country. Has that by, is that understood by those projects, who would then I guess of course be having to go, let's say, to the Amazon fund or, or another, that focal point for that money. Uh, and at the same time that, of course, Brazil is very outspoken at the same time about not having any uh, red from Brazil being uh, be able to claim for international offsets and not being able to access the market. Um, so what are project developers in thinking about that, at least in the distribution of benefits, let's say, in Brazil? Uh, and, and maybe the same, how are same thing for Indonesia? How are all those how are those projects taking consideration that we're probably going towards one big jurisdiction or national system if you know things go like we all hope or uh, maybe some of us hope uh, here in 2015 and, and a new red mechanism in 2020 where there will be significant amounts of money, not the small amounts in the voluntary market. Thanks. I think this is the big question. <laughs> we all made this question for, for government representatives when we had this last meeting with civil society, between civil society and government representatives. And I think the, the, 
issue of the market. It was also always an issue because Brazil had this position against carbon markets and, and markets-based uh, approach. And there is this pressure from civil society that we should have this initiative, we should have funding from coming from markets because there are many projects that are already in the voluntary market and they are using this strategy. So how they will consider this in the national accountability and they, they argue that, okay, this will be the voluntary market, we are not into it and this is, this is something different than the, the UNFCCC uh, negotiations and, and so on. But at the same time, I think if, if there is a decision about markets under the one FCCC, then Brazil would need to, to adapt to it. And this is what the proposal they, they've made in Bonn says. It's kind of like, oh, it's not against market-based initiatives, but still needs a wider debate and, and everything. And in relation to, to the project, I think this is, this is the main question, as I said in the challenges slide, how they will really make these projects accountable in the national level, especially the voluntary ones. They say they wouldn't be, but they would try to, to make it accountable, but they don't give details about how this would happen. So that's, for me, it's the big question. Not just for me. You also no. had a question about the landscape versus jurisdictional approach, and I, uh, perhaps it's not my role to answer, but just to clarify what I think is a, a jurisdictional approach, you really look at political and administrative borders, whereas in a landscape approach, you would more look at the natural, say, ecological borders, uh, for example, a watershed. So it's just the, the unit of an analysis or unit of focus is slightly different and not necessarily overlapping, whether you have kind of ecological versus political borders in your unit. And that the jurisdictional approach can be at, at any scales, which is an important point, I think, not just the subnational. We got a few questions, um, and I think I have to, to draw the line for those. Uh, a few of, two, two sets, basically. One concerns the landscape approach, and for example, one asks that development priorities are the highest on the agenda, and how can RED and the landscape approach fit when, you know, development is really the key? And also a related question on how the lessons we can learn from social and environmental principles to integrate that into this approach. And the third, which is also, I think, an important one, how we can link the landscape approach to the national level, because when RED started out, it was supposed to be kind of at the national level and, and that we need national policies to, 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 to really get to the big changes and not just focus on the, on the more localized project level, which is important, but the big national policies may be also critical. So I don't know if Annie would like to comment on that, both, I mean, the different objectives, environmental, social development, and also this horizontal linking. If any would like to comment on this, how it can be done within a landscape approach. Yeah, well, the, the key word here is the, the implementation at sub-national level uh, with regard to the jurisdictional. Sub-national, like landscape, is kind of uh, a vague, boundary. It can be subnational in terms of uh, government administration. It can be areas or eco ecosystem. So um, in terms of size, again, it is, it's very relative. In one place, it can be very small but complex, or it can be very big but simple because not many people live there, for example. So um, my uh, look on this is that the, the policy, the approach should be national because at the end of the day, it is the national government who are accountable uh, in the international processes, but the implementation is at that sub-national level. It can be, um, you know, district or can be a watershed, can be anything which is smaller than national, but uh, it has to be 
workable kind of size for local government to, to work together. In that sense, the, the complexity can be reduced and from the MRV point of view, maybe the uncertainty can also be reduced with, with less uh, involvement of various actors in it. So, um, it's, it's a challenging kind of issue in terms of defining what is your project boundary, for example. It's, it's, it's unlike a factory producing tire emitting greenhouse gases. It's, it's a big entity which, you know, people coming and going and things are exported, traded, etc. So it will be more complicated. So the, the smaller the size, the less uh, hectic would the, the process be. Um, just to want to add one point. Um, um, some of the civil society organizations in Nepal, they are, when the government is now promoting um, at least one, no, a couple of landscape level um, project documents, the, uh, some of the civil society organizations are skeptical um, in, um, because um, at least at the national level, um, the civil society and other non-state actors would be able to create, educate, uh, pressure um, to hold accountable the government to ensure the more transparent and accountable process um, follows. Um, but when you go to this uh, sub-national level and landscape level, um, that level of uh, effort um, to make the process fully accountable, transparent, participatory, all those things may not happen. And then possibly government ha would have, you know, would take a more non-transparent, non-participatory, that kind of process um, at, at the level of landscape where the civic action is not developed at that level, which is developed at the national level. So that is one skepticism is there. Another is, you now while the country is not fully developing its um, you know, policies, legal system, and also in terms of knowledge, everything, and there is a kind of pressure from possibly donors or some experts to go to the landscape level. Um, and the skepticism is, well, probably once you focus to the certain landscape level, you may forget or you may undermine the national process. So there are two, uh, these issues are there when uh, countries which are not well prepared at the national level and trying to go to the national, uh, sorry, uh, landscape level, um, some level of doubt uh, suspicion is there. And the, sec the last set of questions um, is, uh, I think, a very good dilemma here. Uh, one question, what design options can be proposed to link MRV with benefit sharing and financial compensation after successful emission reduction? Now, the other one is kind of related, well, different handwriting, so not the same person, I presume. Um, that is, well, we want to link MRV and benefit sharing and fin financial and perhaps other types of compensation, but shouldn't we do benefit sharing before that system is in place? So how are we going to do this benefit sharing before we have a decent MRV system in place? Assuming none of you think that we should not do anything in terms of benefit sharing and benefits before those are in place, I mean the, the, the MRV. Any takes on that dilemma? Maybe I can start. Uh, we clearly have a timing issue here uh, in terms of we do want, now that fast phase two is starting, we do want to stimulate activities. Right? We do want that plus to happen on the ground, uh, including all the different things we've talked about here today. Um, the actual carbon benefits may take some time just to generate in the biophysical world uh, and then to be accounted in the financial world. So just by that, if you want things to start to happen now, uh, you, have to, you cannot do it based on carbon performance because that's, that's just something that will take time. Uh, if you plant some trees, they just take a long time to grow before you can actually pay on these things. If you do change agricultural practices, you have a hard time anyways to, to, to attribute the times of carbon savings to that. So, in fact, it may be worthwhile to think much more of an input-based system of benefit sharing to actually bank for activities and to some extent assuming that the benefits will come 
hopefully. But at least that's an approach we should definitely take in the demonstration phase, which is starting now, this phase two, and see um, how much that can actually work. Uh, I think, yeah, there, there are mainly two types of benefits, the, the upfront benefits that would be used for readiness activities, as you said, and then the, the payments for results. And we can't disconsider the first ones because they are essentials for the second ones, and especially when you are dealing with countries that don't have an MRV system, uh, a good MRV system, and also don't have properties, land properties defined. So these are benefits as well. So we can't really disconsider these upfront benefits. Voluntary yeah. Very short one. Mm -hmm. um, we've been going through a, a study related to right and responsibility. So I think if, if the attribution of the benefit is based on those two uh, aspects or elements, uh, we need really to, to measure what the responsibility of the actors on the ground. So without that, I think it, it will be very problematic. So it might create conflicts rather than uh, agreement amongst the players on the ground. So people have the rights, but also responsibility in, in doing things. Good. Um, there is a few social media reporters here. I think I should close. I promised, otherwise I will break my promises. Um, a few social media reporters here and, you know, tweet 140 characters. I would like to have one tweetable message from you, and that should be this. You have worked in this business for a while. And what is the most important thing related to the topic that you have learned over the last five, six years? You have 140 characters, including space. Daniel? The most important thing you have learned related to the topic of today, the last five years? Well, switch the thinking of forests into bigger kind of entity like landscape. Move from forestry to landscape. So for me, I think uh, the institution and tenure, is the, they are the primary, whether we talk raid or conservation or sustainable forest management, anything. So unless we put emphasis on the kind of institution and the security, tenure security uh, that these people have, we wouldn't have any rate, and we'll just be measuring, but uh, not increasing carbon. Mm -hmm. Institutions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I would say that uh, complex challenges call for complex solutions, and sometimes we deal with this challenge with easy solutions. So. I, I don't think we should go for the easy, easiest way because it's more, uh, less expensive or something like that. Sometimes we choose the easy way because of the costs, but we need complex solutions. Martin? Well, lots of things have been said. I would, I would suggest that landscape thinking is broad and holistic, and that's good for Red Plus to work. Or we manage complexity to keep it simple so it works. Uh, that is a challenge. I guess if Albert Einstein was here, he said, do things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Um, I'm not going to make a long summary, but, but just a few points that I think I, I've noted down during this, this debate here and presentations. One, it's not trivial what you count because what you count, one, you can be held accountable for that, and that's in, in the red negotiation or general, the UNFCCC negotiations, account or counting is political because you are be held accountable for that. And it also very much, it gives a policy focus and debate, and, and Martin mentioned Guiana, and, and of course Brazil is an excellent example, and the other countries as well, that the debate that is generated by data, by information, is critical and has policy implications. And thirdly, that we didn't touch more than just at, at, at the surface, is related to what the data you have, the, the systems you have in place, and their 
uh, reliability of those systems, it really depends what you can do. We touched upon this about performance-based system, that we may not have the, at least the ideal system in place. If the data are poor, we have to go through some coarser system and maybe more in the direction of, of rewarding inputs than, than emission reductions, that is, at the other end of output-based measures. So, in the end, the world is complex. Um, we try to simplify it a little bit, but not too much. But I hope that, that you take with you some, some good questions and dilemmas and that you didn't get some simple answers. If you, if you got some, they would probably have been wrong. So uh, I hope it's a good stimulus for your coffee discussion and uh, your post-GLF life. So thanks a lot for attending. Thanks to the four speakers and for the debate, for those who sent questions. Thanks a lot.